Shalom from uh, Jerusalem. This is Powers in Play, a monthly look at the global issues. And um, in this edition, we will focus on the American National Security Strategy document, uh, which was put out by the White House several weeks ago. And along with it, the Department of Defense came out with several derivative documents regarding defense policy. And as we know, in the um, American executive branch, both uh, civilian and uniformed, they take their strategy documents very seriously, both in the preparation and then in the execution, or at least in adherence to guidance. So our issue today is uh, what is the new American national security strategy and what is the role of the Middle East and in particular Israel in this uh, scheme of things. And uh, with us, we will do it uh, by rank. So um, our most senior member is Ambassador Chaim Koren. Um, thank you for coming, retired Ambassador. Then Major General retired Gershon Nakoen, um, formerly a senior officer in the Israeli Defense Forces, but still involved both behind the scenes and in front of them. Welcome, Gershon. Thank you. Reserve Brigadier General Doron Gavish, formerly Chief of the Air and Missile Defense of the Israeli Air Force, and therefore the Israeli Defense Forces. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. And Reserve Colonel and Career Doctor <laughs> Iran Lerman, um, with the uh, Jerusalem um, uh, Institute for Strategic Affairs and uh, the journal uh, uh, put out by, this is uh, an Jerusalem opportunity for Strategic you. Strategic Tribune put out by a Moroccan Muslim friend, some part of our modern reality. Mm -hmm. in, on, on sale in the best bookshops. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, Not quite. Now, Iran, you have studied these documents. Uh, you have written um, a summary or commentary about them. Uh, what should one learn? Uh, what are the uh, most salient points regarding Biden's national security strategy? Well, first of all, it, it's not a departure. It's an elaboration on a document that came out <clears throat> practically weeks into the Biden administration, the interim guidance, which was issued in March 21. And the main themes uh, were there already, but now they are much clearer. But more, moreover, the document is infused by a sense, and that may sound surprising in this dark world we live in, of optimism, of, uh, of uh, uh, a can-do spirit. It doesn't quote Obama. Yes, we can, but he's saying there's no limit to what America can achieve. A decisive we, decade. It, <laughs> and, that, it, and this is a decisive de uh, right. decade ahead of us. This is, we are living in a point of inflection um, in which things are changing in front of our eyes. And, the, and I, quite clearly, since this document came out on the 12th of October, uh, in a very specific historical context, and it clearly was touched up. Um, it, it's a long process, but it was touched up by reference to recent events, this is in, uh, uh, clearly uh, colored by the events uh, of the war in Ukraine, which has shifted uh, quite dramatically against Russia, which basically, from an American point of view, serves as a demonstration of what America can achieve through its close collaboration with allies, a central item of where Biden deliberately differs from his predecessor who undermined NATO. Biden uh, uh, basically speaks again and again about this integrated deterrent concept that brings in co cooperation with allies. And this, sent, this gives uh, the, the, the document a sense mm -hmm. that the West, or what he calls the a world that is, and that's a phrase that repeats again and again, is repeated again and again, a world that is free, open, prosperous, and secure. The free world, 
uh, that that Biden Biden is a relic, if you wish, of of the post post World War II era when the United States led the world. This can be rebuilt. Uh, facing the new challenge, the new challenge is above all China. He was even born during World War II. Yes, probably the last Western leader uh, to uh, have even preceded the baby boom. Uh, yes. generation. So, uh, General Gavish, I, I know you are always well prepared and uh, probably brought your uh, answers from home regardless of my questions. Um, but, but nevertheless, let's, let's try um, and fit Q's and, and A's. Um, Iran mentioned that um, this uh, document does not deviate uh, a lot from the interim guidance which Biden put out shortly after he entered office. And even the interim guidance was not such a deviation, not from um, Donald Trump, probably, but from James Mattis, the defense secretary under uh, Trump, who wrote uh, his national defense strategy and probably uh, had a lot of influence uh, on the administration's mm -hmm. policy, even though uh, he later broke with, with uh, Trump. And Mattis uh, was also a member of President Obama's administration. Again, he fell out with him. And you, um, as a general officer, you are uh, constantly in touch with uh, your American counterparts throughout administrations. How much do you see continuity between all of these administrations? Biden obviously was Obama's vice president. And uh, how much is the change from one to another as reflected among other documents in this one. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think that we should say that it's quite impressive to see the, those two do documents. And not too many governments in the world are so methodology um, driven. Uh, they have the strategy. Both strategies are aligned, the national security strategy and the national defense uh, strategy. And, uh, and the other thing that it's not only the, the documents are aligned, the policies are, are aligned. And uh, you see it, uh, if we're working with the, with the US military, you really see what is being said on those documents and this is what is being applied in the ground. And uh, so uh, going to your question, I think that there is a continuity. And of course, uh, you know, for, for me, one of the main um, you know, areas that I was interested uh, in were uh, the missile defense, for example. So it is interesting to see that in this document, like I saw it even uh, also before, there is a chapter talking about the missile defense and talking about the, the national uh, defense uh, strategy. To be, to be even security. more precise, um, the national defense uh, strategy document is accompanied by two other Documents exactly. regarding the nuclear posture and the, and the missile and air defense. Exactly, <laughs> which is which is of course uh, very interesting, very important, and always highlight the the way that the United States is looking at, at this uh, mission, which is uh, which is really strategic one. The other thing that I've looked at is Iran, uh, which is very interesting, uh, of course, for us. What is the United States? Uh, a strategy toward Iran, and, and, and if you will allow me, I will quote uh, in, in, the, in the national strategy, they are saying, we will portray uh, diplomacy to, uh, to, we will pursue diplomacy to ensure that Iran can never mm -hmm. acquire a nuclear weapon while remain, remaining postured and prepared to use other means should diplomacy fail. Which means that all the options are on the table, and, and this is something that was, uh, for Israel, of course, very important, that we see that all the options are there. If but but uh, the wrong. In, uh, in a minute, there is an option. And once there is an option, it means that you should prepare to it. Uh, so I think this is something that we see along the years. Um, but, there is a continuity there. But you're, you are correct uh, when you uh, read from the passage devoted to Iran, and you go, as practical men would, to the bottom line. However, the top line is that Iran neither has nuclear weapons, nor has it decided to go for one yet. What, what you quote is what will happen 
if um, the Iranians are caught. And uh, the United doing, States will do everything to deny the, those capabilities. Which now, um, General Cohen, you uh, commanded the National uh, Security College in Israel, which obviously... Um, I, I had the privilege to be one of the students. Yes, and, and Ambassador Koren <laughs> <Ambassador Coren, laughs> was there also. Was, yes, was on the staff, yes, and, and Iran uh, was for a guest while. lecturer. <laughs> um, uh, but this is not a pitch for the uh, college. <laughs> Rather, it is a pitch for other nations <clears throat> coming out with similar uh, mm. documents. Um, and you had to, to teach uh, Israeli strategy from a variety of uh, sources, but you, you never had, ex uh, maybe uh, during Ben-Gurion's time in the yes. 1950s, but not later. You the legend is that this was a national security document. No, it was a long disquisition to the cabinet yeah. about what's happening in the next five years. It, it, everything was derived from it, but it yes, was but not in, in anything 1953, like... There was never an Israeli national of defense. Of course, it is not... So, a, so uh, uh, why is it, uh, of course, um, uh, Israelis um, are known uh, for um, improvising, ad-libbing, and, and uh, trying to, to be flexible, not to be tied to, to doctrine. But is that any way to run a country <laughs> or military? Yeah. Several months ago, I participated uh, in a discussion in uh, the Knesset, in, uh, in the team, the specific team for national security uh, documents, something like that. Uh, Eisenkot, uh, last chief of staff, was invited in the mid row, and this was the question, why we don't have a document like that, and who must write that and how to write, what must be the content in a document like that. And among the people in that uh, very, very small uh, discussion, uh, no more than 10 people, not at all we arrived to an, an accepted uh, understanding what really we are expecting from a document like that. Uh, even Amidror, uh, a former, uh, former national security staff. Yes, uh, yes. accused me that even his mother will not agree with my basic premises about the Israeli national interests. <laughs> and what we can find... He, his mother was an underground uh, fighter <laughs> before 1948. <laughs> and if we are just uh, in detecting what is really emphasized here, it is repeated again and again, what are the American national interests? Interest. And what is very, very interesting here that they are emphasizing uh, that business is not as usual. It means that even if we are looking to find a uh, continuity, that means that it is not business as usual, that something is really changing. And we can find here in a very interesting change in the equilibrium they are making in the American very classical tension between uh, interior affairs and foreign policy by the declaration that they are coming together, that you cannot really uh, bring success to interior affairs without coming back to influence the global uh, interests. Mm -hmm. but, but Gershon, you mentioned um, <clears throat> retired Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot. In 2015, uh, he wrote um, on, on, on his yeah. own authority in the national military strategy. And in the um, American uh, format, uh, the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, after the Secretary of Defense comes out with the defense strategy, which is after the president's national security strategy, the Joint Chiefs uh, have their of own course. military strategy. In Israel, only the third link in the chain uh, was, was published. Um, how did you, uh, you generals, on the general staff, in the uh, think tanks, um, how did you derive military policy from the two top floors which that were missing? Absent. <laughs> uh, Although there he was, was the Meridor uh, document, which yes, I uh, think uh, was something to rely to, and it's very it good. Is a, this is a Knesset. Uh, just document. getting dust on the shelves, and uh, nobody really. <laughs> but uh, I was uh, involved in that process. The government never formally endorsed. The chief of staff, uh, Eisenkot, was uh, really <clears throat> accused by uh, 
Yagi Levy, for example, uh, by dis- disturbing uh, the, the, the coherency and the hierarchical order, and they wrote an article to defend the uh, right of chief of staff to write that as an invitation. And to, you must have some guidance to uh, work, but, uh, to work it from. But it's, uh, 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 it's uh, journal uh, uh, didn't find well, it's not too any late. interest in what I wrote. <laughs> so, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ambassador Koran, um, I have bad news for the region you specialized in. And uh, obviously, Egypt um, and and uh, other countries in Africa. When when one looks um, at the order of priorities set in uh, the national security strategy, obviously China is at the top. And when um, Biden talks um, about the decisive decade, what he really means is that by 2030, China uh, would be um, a fierce competitor, even more so than it is um, today. So number one is China. Number two, Russia. Number three, the Western Hemisphere, the United States homeland and Latin America. Only then do they come to the Middle East. They obviously um, took the Middle East, which for the last 20 years was uppermost. Uh, CENTCOM was probably the most important uh, American uh, command. And now it's, it's number four. What does it mean for the region, and especially if you look at Egypt, uh, Egypt uh, is hosting the climate uh, uh, summit. Uh, Biden is coming. And uh, President Biden is coming. It's a tribute to President Sisi. But nevertheless, um, there are limited resources. Uh, There is a limited um, attention span. Um, Does that mean that they are going to forget about us all? the Middle East reacting accordingly. Namely, it's not only Egypt uh, that uh, for a while, for the time of, I remember when I was there in the time of President Obama, uh, they were really not happy with the American policy. The ruling elite. You don't speak about the 100 million Egyptians. (laughs) Of course. Now, I just remind you humbly that recently uh, Saudi Arabia rejected um, pretty bluntly uh, the request of uh, President Biden to, oil price. Uh, with the oil and energy. But again, yeah. uh, much uh, like my question to you regarding Egypt, is it Saudi Arabia or one hair apparent to the crown? Uh, I would say... Uh, Taking into consideration the age of his father, I think uh, uh, MBS is uh, knowing what he's doing and he's leading to a certain point of uh, understanding what's going on. Moreover, if you check carefully his policy towards Russia, for example, not talking about China, you can see clearly uh, how he tries to shape his new uh, policy towards the future. Even relatively marginal country like Sudan, uh, if you took uh, care, uh, if you uh, look carefully how they behave uh, from the very uh, beginning war of Russia in Ukraine, you could see that the deputy uh, president of Sudan visited Moscow in the second day of the war. The Russians are taking gold from Sudan in order to uh, finance their war in So U- this is real politic. Right. But, 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 but they complaining, the Sudanese, for example, that the American policy are uh, um, actually jeopardizing their relationship with us, for example. So let me throw in two okay. other terms and then open it and, and go to Iran. One is human rights, mm, and the other is energy and energy security, in which Africa all of a sudden is um, uh, a coveted. And Iran, of course. So, yeah. But human rights, um, okay. for instance, with in Egypt, um, the American administration, sometimes uh, Republican, sometimes Democratic, have shifting views right. on, on um, how to deal with human rights problems um, vis-a-vis strategic uh, interests. 
um, Biden came in, of course, with declarations, and even in this document, uh, he promises um, to take care of human rights. But in reality, is that possible? Um, to be frank, I don't think so. Uh, it, they might um, uh, seek a better uh, behavior from the leaders in Egypt or elsewhere, but to expect that tomorrow uh, they change the state of mind and there will be a clear democracy, I don't think it's real. Um, well, first of all, the, uh, one of the most striking things in the Middle East chapter, fourth in the regional order, as you say, is that there is no mention of Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, exactly. Emirates. or Egypt. Uh, the only countries actually mentioned by name, uh, Israel and the Palestinian issue. Uh, in uh, passing. In part, uh, well, and that's, and by the way, uh, that's from an Israeli point of view, probably the most problematic uh, aspect because in that document to put in the text from his statements in the West Bank in, in, in July about the Palestinian state based on the 67 borders with swaps, that's, um, let's say, take, putting an agenda on the table that's totally irrelevant for any Israeli government. Well, that's, that's your view, but other mm -hmm. things may differ, other people may differ. It's, it's, not go it's not going to be practical because there's nobody on the other side to, to actually negotiate the fact. Okay. Uh, and Iran is mentioned, Iran, and, and I, I agree with Dohan, by the way, that Iran is mentioned in a way which is clearly adversarial. Iran is put in the same category, not in the same league, as but North in the Korea. same category as Russia and China, as authoritarian uh, under, uh, uh, enemies of the uh, better order, of the rules-based order. But secondary, like North Korea. But secondary. But, uh, and the use of force is implied, and this, this sounds like a direct translation from the Hebrew, by the way, Aruchu Muhan, that's a very good Hebrew. In America, you don't often find this uh, joint phrase, postured and prepared. But um, having said so, there's also a couple of passages in the, in the text that uh, make the use of force subject to a whole series of preconditions. The American people should give their consent. By the way, not Congress, because no American administration as an administration, as an executive branch ever admitted the constitutional validity of the uh, uh, War Powers Act of 1975. So they don't say Congress, but the American people should speak and, and know that this is done in their name and it should be the last resort and it should be according to norms, to our norms and values. Um, this is not too different from the Weinberg Powell principles of the 1980s, especially following the debacle in Beirut. Uh, yes. They they know they want to know what the exit strategy in coming uh, is coming in. Mm -hmm. They want uh, to be based on a broad consensus. Uh, they don't want a new Vietnam. That's clearly the uh, I think the legacy of, of uh, Pow Colin Powell tried to apply this in ninety one and again two thousand three. At the end of the day, it leaves a question mark as to whether. Um, beyond deterrence, beyond ex uh, integrated deterrence, there will act be actually, there will be action against them. But the manner in which the traditional American allies are not even mentioned, I think is very much in line with what Ambassador Cohen has been saying. But, but nevertheless, uh, Daron, the new emphasis or renewed emphasis on alliances, um, uh, both formal and informal, uh, NATO, which uh, during Trump's time uh, was uh, uh, set aside, he, um, the president himself mm -hmm. um, made fun of it. And what we see here in the CENTCOM area um, of uh, responsibility, um, very often we hear of exercises and operations with dozens of uh, participants, mm -hmm. Israel along with mm -hmm. uh, Arab and Muslim countries. Well, just a demonstration jump in Bahrain. Who would have thought this possible? <laughs> yes, a paratroopers uh, jumped, but uh, we couldn't get a video of it for, <laughs> for some reason. They spoke about it, but did not show it. Um, is that um, a signal that uh, even without boots on the ground and with the emphasis on over the horizon that the Americans are here and in the Ukraine, we see that they are backing up uh, uh, the Ukrainians almost 
20 billion dollars worth of supplies. Uh, now, by, by current dollars, it uh, may not be much more than the $2.2 billion that Israel got in 1973 as an emergency assistant during the Yom Kippur War. But nevertheless, it is being taken from American stocks, war stocks. Oh. And if, if there is an emergency, which uh, U.S. forces uh, would be called uh, to participate in, uh, maybe they uh, will not be well equipped. Hmm. Well, at, at least in the area of air and missile defense, uh, and as we as we talked before, uh, this is something significant in the in the. In no the, matter what we will talk about, you will go back to your of beloved <laughs> missiles <laughs> and anti. That. <laughs> That's good. Uh, but we must emphasize that even the Chinese uh, replace uh, divisions, armor divisions, in the border of North Korea with uh, new systems of air defense. Yeah, I agree. But, but going back, to, by going back to, the, to the document, I fully agree. And I think this is aligned with your question, is that they, they are still talking about postures and preparedness. So it's there. The postures is there. The forces are there. There is no redraw or something like this from the Middle East. They are there. This is the first thing. The second thing that I, th- I think it's, it's uh, very interesting in this uh, document, that they go further. Uh, they are talking about integration. Mm-hmm. They are talking about air integration among the countries in the Middle East. This is something new. We didn't see it in, 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 yeah. in the past. So the This week there was evidence of Israeli air defense systems already deployed in the Gulf. Yes, so, and, right. but, but what, what does it mean in <clears throat> practical terms when, when countries, first of all, have technological secrets they want to keep rather than share, especially because they fear that the Iranians and the Russians and the Chinese might get their hands on such uh, systems if they are not secure. Does it mean that you must have some central control uh, mechanism? Does it mean that, uh, for instance, what Iran just mentioned, Israeli operators and maintainers must be on the spot? There is always, there is, there is few ways to do it. Uh, it, it really, I, I wouldn't, I don't think that we should get to the tactics of how to do it. But the idea is that they, we are doing it. We could do it by voice, we could do it by electronics. Uh, everyone wants to keep his own, um, you know, security, which is okay. There is cyber area, there, there is a lot of other means that you have to take care of. But the idea is that we are cooperating. And, and think this is something very promising to, to the Middle East. And of course, from Israel, there is the, the, this is a, a big advantage. And this is number one. And, and number two, and, and it goes back even to your previous question, the shift from UCOM to CENTCOM, this is also something very significant for European Israel. Command from slash European Command, from the European Command, going to the, to the Central Command. Now we are part of this area. And, and we are collaborating with, with the Middle East countries, with the United States as, as a leader of it. So I think that, you know, from a, nation, from a defense strategy point of view, we see a shift and, and it's a positive shift. Now, Gershon, um, we here in Israel uh, read these documents um, and uh, we try to interpret them um, in a positive vein. Um, we still get uh, $4 billion a year uh, in military aid, and of course we see ourselves as part of the um, American orbit. Also, our tactics and doctrines are, are at times similar, not always, and you taught them to American officers uh, when, when they were uh, your students and the Israeli officers go to American uh, military schools. But how do you think they are read by the adversaries? If a Russian National Security College or a Chinese one were to task their staff and students to analyze these documents. What would they see um, summing up? <coughs> they, they will really find a very a new emphasis upon interoperability, coalition, integration. It is again, a, repeated again and again, yeah. and Regarding uh, the treatment of uh, uh, the Americans against Russia, we can really find new roots of a, a new conception that they are not really uh, going to sacrifice themselves with the 
American troops to fight, they are really intending that NATO will do that. Uh, it means that they are treating the conflict with Russians differently from the competitor China. With the Chinese, they are taking this uh, competition as a challenge to lead by themselves. Regarding Russia, they are really making all the efforts that it will come with the Ukrainian and the help of NATO. And even this is in a, a very, very interesting emphasis that they are not trying to bring that war to an end. But, but there are two different theaters. Um, we have the Indo-Pacific uh, theater, which is naval. Um, and if China wants to invade Taiwan, it must uh, mount a cross-channel um, invasion uh, and what happens in the Spratly Islands. And obviously, we see that the emphasis there is on the Navy. Uh, even, even in the uh, cooperation with Australia regarding the nuclear, nuclear-powered of course it is submarines. Navy, absolutely. And, yes. and in Europe, it's a land war. Um, and then a very conventional, uh, classical warfare with weapons uh, from uh, late uh, 1950-60. Yeah. So, so uh, of course, there's a different outlook um, that the Russians see uh, versus the Chinese when they look at what of the course, Americans uh, are doing. They are uh, definitely describing China as a very, very... A unique challenge, and uh, the first challenge due to the technological achievement and the ec economical uh, status of their achievements, uh, not Russia. Now, uh, Chaim, Ambassador Koren, um, historically, of course, uh, Britannia ruled the waves in the Mediterranean, right. and Great Britain, when it was still great, was the dominant power in the uh, Levant. Um, and the Soviet Union managed to leapfrog over the British and the Americans, which were only starting to get in, in the mid-1950s. Um, Egypt's President Sadat decided to break with the Soviets and move towards the American orbit for various um, economic and, and other in reasons. Right. When, when Arab leaders read these documents and see what is happening, um, are they uh, reconsidering, perhaps uh, going uh, beyond what you said about Saudi Arabia? Uh, are they trying to um, move into the Chinese orbit, for instance, the Russian one, if there, if there still is one? I wouldn't go that far, but I think uh, one element regarding to China and its plan of the road and the belt, they already control some of the ports in Europe, or they coming from the uh, uh, from north? They planning uh, to do. They they seem to do it. Whatever you would like to think. So they already on the on the race, and they they know what they are doing. Uh, and I think they're a little bit disappointing from uh, the ability of Russia in the war of Ukraine. But that's a different story. Now. Uh, if uh, the leaders in the Middle East would like to uh, totally change their position, I don't think so. Uh, they're trying to look or they're trying to persuade the American administration, uh, specifically after that, to coming back uh, uh, to the time that we, that we have a new reality here in the Middle East, and for the first time, we are not putting the story of the Palestinians as a leading story, but rather after Abraham Accords, we have a new reality that we have the main target both for Israel and its allies from the Sunni uh, Arab camp like Egypt, Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, some others. And we can use this opportunity for both uh, targets. One, uh, the efficient war against terrorism. And second, the story of Iran. If the U.S. would take into consideration what, is re what really Iran and is, like happened in the last and day. In addition, we can just uh, look how they are treating that uh, mission in the Middle East with the word de-escalation. 
Right. I mean, it is something else than uh, to try to do something positively. And the no. message is very clear. Yeah. We're not going to okay. do nation building anymore. But We're not going to do regime change. But there's a very important point we, are, we, we need to mention. Uh, almost at the same level of importance in, in the China and Russia and the, in the challenges, the, the, the enemies, if you, to use an Israeli uh, yeah. language. Without calling them a competitor. Competitors, <laughs> rivals, Rivalry. challenges. Yeah. 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 But there's also a, a, an immense uh, emphasis, and that's again very different from the Trump era, on the global um, transnational problems such as the climate crisis and uh, migration, migration right. and uh, um, pandemics, obviously, right. and the lessons of the corona crisis. And here, interestingly, um, while Israel is not mentioned by name, but uh, uh, the possibility of contribution, not only in the traditional fields of geostrategy, but also in others, uh, there's a good piece in the Jerusalem Strategic uh, So happens this that week. you are so, quoting from this uh, uh, by, by Ambassador Miron, uh, who wrote about Israel's uh, innovation expanding now beyond uh, traditional high-tech and military-related to food security, to uh, water, that's a long story already, and other fields which are relevant to this grand American project. So Israel could position itself very much as a relevant partner, on one condition, and that's not that's quite implicit, but loud and clear in this document. Stay away from China. Uh, do, keep your technologies out of the wrong hands. It, the message is for everyone, Europe and others, but uh, uh, it has been conveyed individually to Israel. And this is the explanation about the More than absolute once. absent of uh, uh, connecting uh, the main uh, uh, treatment to the Israeli potential, because Israel could be indispensable in delivering several uh, new capabilities to the American interest, and it is absolutely absent. But Iran, uh, you have been um, in the military and then uh, on the national security staff, and uh, planners um, always write about uh, contingencies, about uh, potential problems, and rarely uh, do they live to see some of them in actuality um, jump from the paper into the battlefield or into world arena. We have seen uh, in the Russia-Ukraine war both the invasion as predicted by the intelligence communities of, of the West, perhaps not by Ukraine itself, or, or maybe politically they didn't want to portray it so. And we have seen the danger of energy insecurity in what right. happened to Nord Stream and, and even... Uh, with Russians the, are now blaming the British. Yes, and... Uh, <laughs> they are excellent. Of course, because, <laughs> they are because, really excellent. The because British. they remember Commander Crabb <laughs> in the 1950s when, when they visited uh, Britain and the frogmen uh, tried to look at their uh, vessel. But um, does that mean that um, we should seriously now consider, for instance, the problems of energy security, because these are not science fiction. This could happen. Clearly, uh, and by the way, they can, the energy challenges can come from unexpected places. Um, the, the, one of the main emph points of emphasis about Africa in the document has to do with fighting terrorism. Now, uh, in northern Mozambique, uh, the activities of a, uh, let's say, Daesh, ISIL affiliate. No longer Frelimo. Which, not Frelimo anymore. Frelimo is the government. No. Yes, <laughs> during the Portuguese. Uh, uh, there was, there was the, uh, the other one that was support. Uh, Frelimo was the government. And it was yeah. the a nasty uh, underground supported by South Africa. But now it's Islamists in, the, in northern Mozambique who scared away Total from a production deal of $30 billion. People who think that uh, oil companies will not run away under conflict should look at what happened in Mozambique. And that's, Total is the that's company? Seven, that's seven times bigger Total than the Eastern the Mediterranean Basin. And they ran away because Total of is insecurity. Also in the Lebanon-Israel deal. Right. Uh, and so so the, the lesson is that de-escalation and energy security are interconnected. 
And we saw this clearly in the American stance on the, and yet the, is the Lebanese are, deal. Now, yeah. now we we have uh, we still have a lot of energy, but not enough time um, <laughs> okay. to go on. Uh, very quickly, if you could add or change one line in the document, let's say you could add one to the draft, what would it be? I would uh, will take into consideration uh, approach. A, a little bit different approach to the Middle East based on uh, keep on the momentum of the bloc in the Middle East that serving the U.S., namely Israel and its allies here. Okay, Gershon, five words. Africa. Africa. Uh, okay. Africa five. The ch- they are ignoring the Chinese influence in Africa. Oh. Doron. I agree yeah. with uh, Ambassador Koren, uh, but I think we should also say this is a very positive document from the Israeli point of view. Okay. Yeah. I would be more robust about the possible use of force. Uh, there's n- uh, All these hedges make your enemies think you'll run away at the decisive moment. Thank you very much, Dr. Colonel Iran Lerman, Brigadier General Doron Gavish, okay. Major General Gershon Cohen, Ambassador Dr. Chaim Koren, and we will be back with another edition of Powers in Play here on TV7 News next month. Shalom from Jerusalem.